think for most of us, parking is something we witness all the time, experience, but never think about. And Henry has. Henry, welcome. Thanks for coming. Can you talk us through the process? How does one decide to write a book about parking? I just loved it so much. Couldn't couldn't stop couldn't stop talking about it, thinking about it. Um, I think the the story really begins with my work as a journalist because I write about cities, and so uh, I spent a lot of time working on subjects like housing, transportation, the environment, architecture, and what you see as you look into each one of those subjects. And I think I hope that the book gets this across: is that at the heart of each one of them is um, is parking. It really is the foundational attribute of so many other things that we think of as being completely unrelated. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. One of the moments where I had this sort of eureka moment about um, the, the role of parking was when I was in Houston. And I went to Houston to write about what was happening with development after Hurricane Harvey. Because in case you don't know, Houston experienced three so-called thousand year storms in three consecutive years. Thousands of people had water in their houses up to you know eight feet high. And uh, each one was a complete disaster. And they were left thinking, well, how did we get into this position? What happened? And the answer turned out to be that upstream development in Houston had gone on for so long and had been so intense in consuming all the native land that lay upstream from the city that properties that had been built had been built downstream began to flood. And that's an example of how an environment that is mostly parking begins to um, do something so fundamental as redirect the course of stormwater to say nothing of its effect on the urban heat island, how much we drive, the way our buildings look, how much our housing costs, and all those things. So I sort of put those together and well, there's the book. I mean, am I right in saying that parking in many US cities is the main use of land? Certainly in downtowns, it is the number one use of land. And when we say number one, we don't necessarily mean um, more than 50% of the land is parking, but simply that there's more parking than there is anything else. Um, and I think that's not that surprising when you think about parking as um, the main uh, externality associated with car culture. I think we're all familiar with the impact of car culture on American development, right? The um, arrival of the automobile transformed, well, not just American cities, but the entire world, right? Um, but the biggest spatial impact of the automobile is the parking space that is required to store all the automobiles. It's not the cars, it's not the factories, it's not the roads themselves, it is the parking space. And so yes, in most American cities, parking is the number one use of land. Um, and in some American downtowns, it actually does occupy about 50% of the entire area. I mean, there is literally more space for storing cars than there is for the city itself. And bizarrely, the places that we live in are very expensive now in these cities. The place where your car lives is usually free. Right, usually free. And um, if not free, uh, then uh, very much subsidized by laws that require parking and designate enormous amounts of public land for parking. I, mean, I think this arbitrage that you're getting at between how much it costs to, say, rent an apartment and how cheap it can be in terms of pure square footage to store a car, um, you see people taking advantage of that arbitrage in real time in the United States, because housing has become so expensive and parking remains um, required by law, um, it, its price has sort of uh, has been forced down because it can't be used for anything else, at least legally. Of course, there are millions of Americans who now live in garages, like garages of single family homes, to be clear. They've been converted into accessory dwelling units and you know they have beds and air conditioners and washing machines and they feel like houses, but as far as the law is concerned, they are in fact parking. And, and the more tragic example of that arbitrage is people living in their cars because housing is so expensive and parking is so cheap. Um, many people have, have done a calculation and realized that um, society is offering them this opportunity and, and, and that's the only opportunity they have to find housing. It's a mind-blowing book to read because you take this 
subject that's really been unexplored in, let's say, books for non-academics. And one of my mind-blowing experiences reading it is you think, well, logically, when you start to think about parking, you think, well, a car would have on average two parking spaces, one at the house and one at the place of work, stroke, uh, shops. But in fact, I mean, an American car has on average, there's about five spaces or so per car. I mean, it's huge. Yeah, I think that's the the thing that I find is actually, it can be counterintuitive because I think many of us, when we think about parking, to the extent we think about it at all, what sticks in our mind is the memory of a time when it was difficult to find parking. And that's what we, that's what comes first to mind. Uh, but in fact, of course, most parking most of the time is easy. And um, spatially speaking, right, there are uh, estimates range from four to as high as eight spaces for every car. Um, so it's an astonishing amount of parking. And that is true, not just in the United States as a whole, but it's often true even in places where people complain about the availability of parking. And this is important because I think it would be tempting to hear those statistics and say, well, okay, sure, there's enough parking in the country as a whole, but in my neighborhood, we are suffering from a real parking shortage and therefore we need to demolish the old movie theater or whatever to build a giant publicly funded parking garage that's gonna put the city in debt for the next 30 years. And I think a lot of people say that, a lot of cities in fact do that. Um, but the truth is that even in those places, there's a lot of parking available um, and it's not, uh, and, it, and it feels scarce because it's not properly priced, it's not properly managed, it's not shared, um, and it's often hard to find. Then we had this astonishing natural experiment while you were writing the book during COVID, when people needed to be outside to meet each other, of a lot of cities, including Paris, including New York, taking away parking spaces and giving them especially to restaurants for outdoor seating. So we had this, these eternal complaints, there is no parking, and then they took away a lot of parking. And to some degree, in many places, this is endured. So what have we learned from that COVID experiment? Well, I, I joke in the book that I, I feel like I wished upon the monkey's paw. Have you guys, are you familiar with that story? Somebody, um, you get three wishes granted by this monkey's paw and uh, for the character in the story, they all come true in the most horrible way. And for me, my wish going into this book <laughs> was that uh, people, readers, and the general public could experience this epiphany that I had had, which is that there is a tremendous amount of potential value that's locked up in public space that has been designated as parking, but could potentially be used for something else and, and be used, I think, to great effect for something else. Uh, and so I went into this book thinking, boy, if I could only make people see that, of course, four months after I begun my book leave, I heard about this virus in Wuhan, China, and, you know, the rest is history to some extent. Um, but, uh, but it soon became apparent that yes, like people actually were having this epiphany and that all across the world, people were taking these parking space, excuse me, parking spaces that had hitherto been considered, uh, an indispensable part of doing business. I mean, you see, uh, I, I saw quotes from small business owners defending their parking spaces, you know, accusing a mayor who builds a bike lane of having blood on their hands for taking away a few parking spaces. This is the kind of rhetoric that gets employed routinely. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what happened in the end, of course, was that many of these small businesses, the ones who had fought most vociferously to maintain all this parking and require parking with every new use, saw that actually it was better that that space be used for something else. And from the perspective of the city, it was clear not only, I think, in social terms and in res with respect to public life, but also um, in financial terms, because the amount of tax revenue that gets generated by uh, having a dozen cafe tables operating in a parking space that had previously been rented out for, what, a dollar an hour? And, it, and, and that probably only over uh, a few hours over the course of a day. Um, it was, I think, pretty evidently... A, a massive step forward for this idea about public space that happened just in a few weeks. And you make the point that it doesn't just have to be restaurant terraces. Once we start thinking about if we are going to take them away, what to do, it can be a vegetable garden, it can be a mini park, it can be a bench, it can be a little library. There's a million uses we could put these spaces to. Yeah. And, you know, I think to go back to the, the story I was uh, 
saying about Houston, one of the big crises that a lot of cities are dealing with right now is that there are these more and more intense rainstorms juiced by climate change that are causing stormwater flooding and overwhelming our 20th or in many cases 19th century sewer systems. And one of the things you can do with the curb lane if you decide to rethink it, rethink its role as permanent free car storage um, is to is to construct you know, green infrastructure, right? Like greenery that will soak up that rainwater before it gets into the sewers, before it overwhelms people's basements. And of course, that's just one idea. Um, in many cases, the decision we make to allocate curb space solely for the storage of private vehicles actually impedes us from creating ways for people to get around in other ways. And I think people often complain, well, if you take away my parking space, how do you expect me to get downtown or how do you expect me to take my kids to school? And I think that's a fair point. At the same time, unless you begin to take away those parking spaces, you cannot unlock the urban real estate that's required to create a bus lane, to create a bike lane, to create a safe place for people to get around in another way than just driving in a private automobile. I was very struck by one stat you gave, which is that I think most trips more than half of trips in u.s metropolitan areas are a mile or less so in other words these could be done just by walking let alone bikes or bicycles but i suppose people are getting into their car for a trip of less than a mile partly because it's it's not safe to walk because there's cars everywhere i think that's right over the entire uh over all u.s metro areas cities and suburbs uh half of all trips are under three miles many are under one and um, I think people find this statistic very surprising because when we tend to think about travel in American cities, what we're thinking about mostly uh, is the commute. And the commute is the longest trip of the day for most people. It tends to be a trip that can only be made by automobile because most jobs are not located in downtown where they might be served by transit, but are sort of sprawling across the metro area. And of course, American cities are massive. I mean, uh, you know, even the fifth, sixth largest American city is a metropolis of five, six million people. Um, so that is one big labor market and people are commuting from one end to the other every day. So a lot of these commutes are never going to be replaced by electric bike, by bike, by golf cart, by bus, whatever. Um, but uh, but it turns out the commute is a, a bit misleading because most trips people make are not commutes. And in fact, uh, especially perhaps in this remote work era, um, the trips that I think planners really should be focused on are um, the shorter trips, going shopping, taking kids to school, um, seeing friends, going to the gym, those kinds of things. Those are often neighborhood trips. Those are the trips that tend to be under three miles. And yeah, that's a distance that could be made some other way. Um, but it has to begin with changes to the street space. And a lot of those changes hinge on thinking differently about parking. And I'll give you a very concrete example of that. In um, these transportation planners have this concept they call daylighting, which is when you take an intersection and you remove the cars that are parked uh, closest to the light on all eight corners. And what that does is it creates sight lines for drivers who are approaching the intersection so that they can see if somebody is about to cross the street from 100 yards away, especially if that somebody is a small person who might not be taller uh, than the hood of a car. Um, now, this is like a pretty much a slam dunk in terms of what you can do to make safer streets and make sure that people don't get killed trying to cross the street. But of course, most cities don't do that because they're reluctant to take away the parking spaces. And that's a real example of how the desire to preserve parking impedes our ability to make safer streets. Now, we happen to be in a city which since about 2010 has actually made quite large strides to push out the car, reduce parking and that accelerated during COVID. How do you see Paris's kind of march away from the car? I think it's been something that has been underway for much longer than the current mayoral administration. Um, as early as the 1960s, you're seeing groups in Paris um, representing this sort of emergent urban coalition of environmentalists, um, uh, liberal professionals, um, sort of bobos, um, as well as 
the working poor who often don't own automobiles, or at least didn't in the 1960s and 70s, and, uh, and, and whose buildings were often threatened by the highway projects that were, you know, even in, even in Paris, um, that were designed to make life easier for people living in the suburbs. Um, so that's really the point at which, to which I would date Paris's efforts to rethink the impact of the car. After the right bank expressway gets completed and the périphérique gets completed, Paris basically gets spared any further automobile projects of that scale, and that is thanks to organized resistance. Lots of planners, there, there were plans, you can look them up. And also thanks to the death of Pompidou, who dies suddenly in office age 62 when he'd planned to destroy a lot of Paris. Yes, a, a lucky, lucky break for pedestrians everywhere. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I would just say that Paris is not unique. Uh, I, I think my theory, my running theory about Paris and many other European cities is that they were just five or 10 years behind the United States in making it possible for everybody to drive everywhere all the time. And then the oil crisis happened. And suddenly there's this reimagining and there's this realization that wow, this method of transportation is not sustainable. In the meantime, this urban coalition gains gains power. And uh and, and then, you know, by the 1990s, 2000s, you're getting stuff like um Paris Plage and uh streets that are closed down on Sundays um to allow people to walk around. And then um obviously the last five years, I'm sure many of you are Parisians, you probably don't need an introduction, but there have been hundreds and hundreds of miles of bike lanes created, streets closed to traffic outside schools, um, all kinds of, of innovations designed to reduce the place of the car in the city. Now, in Paris, even more so than in many cities, that has created a, it was in part a culture war, and in part a real argument between suburbanites and city dwellers. And suburbanites in Paris argue, well, I need my car. You've created for me a car dependent environment where I live, and it's the only way I can get around. Certainly until by about 2030, 68 new metro stations will be built in the Paris suburbs, the argument might change. But in general, looking beyond Paris, how do you respond to that quite valid often suburbanite critique of anti-parking measures? It's a very interesting argument because I think it's, it's, really, an, it's really a pretty new one. Um, and it's especially new in the United States where uh, the run-up in urban real estate prices over the last 20 years has completely changed the conversation around urban politics. Um, a lot of these neighborhoods that suffer from parking shortages in the United States were supposed to be demolished in the 1960s. They were redlined. They were they were marked off as zones of disinvestment and obsolete buildings. So to be clear, you're talking about the city centers, the, the epicenters, the old neighborhoods of great cities. Right, which, of course, now, as we now know, are among the most expensive places to live in the entire world. I mean, I'm talking about places like Santa Monica in California or Wicker Park in Chicago or Fort Greene in Brooklyn um, Back Bay in Boston, like all these neighborhoods were considered unacceptable by the standards of automobile focused mid century planners. And um, today, of course, they are resurgent. And that has introduced to the United States a conversation that has been happening in uh, Europe for some time, which is about the right of um, city residents, city politicians to make decisions that might be perceived as anti-car um, because they threaten the right of access of suburbanites who depend on their cars um, to get into the city. And I, I don't think there's an easy answer to this question. Maybe we can focus on Paris for a moment and come back to the United States in a minute. In Paris, um, the discrepancy between the city and the suburbs is really sharp. Uh, Paris has a higher income than most of its suburbs, if not all. Um, Obviously, real estate prices here are super high. And of course, perhaps Paris occupies some special status as both the capital of the country and the center of the region. And access for everybody in the region should be prioritized, um, even if that means lots and lots of parking. The flip side of that, of course, is that lots and lots of parking comes with serious externalities for the people who live in the city. And not all of them are rich. In fact, uh, the rate of poverty here is also higher than it is in many suburbs. And those are the people who often suffer most from the externalities that are associated with car culture. And I'm talking about things like um, 
particulate pollution, right, which we all know is really, really bad in this city, um, as well as traffic accidents, which Paris has miraculously, in the last few years, managed to get down to zero. I mean, zero people were killed by automobiles or in automobiles in Paris in April or in May. So that is just an astounding statistic that would be unthinkable in an American city of this size. And yet it's been achieved here. And so I understand that suburbanites feel they have a, a right to park and drive in the city. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of effective counter arguments to that as well. So we're pushing the boundaries towards the new city without parking, without enough parking, without much parking. Sorry, I strike the word enough. Where is this movement going? What is the ideal that we're trying to reach? Where does that ideal exist now? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I think, you know, I think you got to start different standards for different places. <laughs> I think a lot of what seems like um, uh, daily reality in Paris in the 1990s would be pedestrian paradise for anybody who lives in Los Angeles today, right? So I think we we shouldn't try and apply one standard across all these different cities. But I hope that one of the things one of the things that I'm trying to do in the book is to make a case for um, the ability to walk and uh, and for these decisions that are being made now about parking, not being about um, taking away people's choices and taking away people's freedom to drive, but rather granting a freedom, which is the freedom to decide how you want to get from A to B. And in most of the United States right now, that's not a choice people have. Now, you may say Americans have opted in to live in the suburbs with a lawn and a picket fence in a single family home and all that. Perhaps uh, at the same time, the price of real estate in these walkable parking challenge neighborhoods suggests that perhaps we ought to build a few more of them. Um, and so I think um, ultimately my standard would be you know, pretty close to what the, you know, 15 minute city conspiracy, which is that we ought to lock you in your home and not let you go beyond 15 minutes from it. And that's a, that's a joke. That was just a joke. Um, you know, as the globalist elite, let's, let's hammer this down so we can then go and impose it on the unwilling uh, populace. It, the 15 minute city, we can do it in an old place like Paris, which was built before the car. It's quite easy to retrofit without the car. I don't see how you can do the 15 minute city in Austin or Los Angeles. How are we going to set about destroying, you know, life for good drivers in those cities? What, what should we do? Well, take away their parking spaces for starters. Um, no, of course, this is why different standards for different places. But um, in America, I think one of the reasons, and this is true in, in Paris too, frankly, that the 15 minute city um, narrative as it's put forth by Carlos Moreno and everybody else, uh, to me, falls so flat is that they often neglect to think about work and it comes off as an afterthought. It's like, oh, well, this works for every well, oh, well, jobs. Uh, that's another story. We'll talk about that later. It's like, no, you can't, you can't cut that out of the picture. It's not a 15 minute city if the people who work in the grocery store have to travel for 90 minutes to get to work. And that seems self explanatory. And that's, in my view, a pretty big shortcoming in. Well, that's a big, you know, a big social problem, obviously, in Paris in particular. Um, in other places, however, in the United States, for example, um, I think it is possible to imagine a neighborhood unit where many goods and services are accessible within 15 minutes of somebody's house, even if their job isn't. Now, this means, of course, that many of those people who have those jobs will still have to own cars to get to those jobs. But you know, in the United States, the median rate of car ownership per household is over two, two cars per household. So when we think about how these neighborhoods could be adapted and the changes that people could make, I don't think we're talking about getting people to abandon their cars entirely. We're talking about change on the margins in which a household that has three cars goes to two, household that has two cars goes to one, or a household that has one decides that maybe the trip to school could be made on a bicycle. And those are the kinds of changes that I think are within reach in U.S. cities, um, even if, you know, turning them into Paris is, is not. 
you mentioned work. I mean, we're just in the midst, partly because of COVID, of so many quite remarkable changes in how we use space. And one is working from home, which is much more advanced in the US than here. Then in the last 15 years has been ride hail vehicles, which for a lot of people is obvious that they need to own a car and ride hail vehicles don't park much. And then we have e-bikes for longer distances and the biggest selling electric vehicles in Europe are not electric cars or electric bikes by quite a large margin. So if you put those three things together, does that make it more realistic in more places to move to this parking low paradise? I think it's possible. Um, in the United States, for a long time, we required parking as part of every new home. It's like if you wanted to buy a house, they wouldn't tell you that you needed to put in a certain number of bathrooms, but they would tell you that you needed a certain number of parking spaces. It was required by law, still is in most jurisdictions. It adds a lot of, um, it adds a huge cost onto the construction of new housing, and it deforms our architecture in favor of more grayness, more asphalt, more parking. And um, it also encourages lots of people to drive um, because it functions as a subsidy for a car ownership. Now, these policies have come under attack in under, I don't mean to exaggerate, it's not that exciting. They have begun to be repealed in many cities over the last five to 10 years, which is a total about face from 50 years of planning and a pretty exciting development. And there's two reasons that's happening. And one is because people are aware of the urgency of the housing affordability crisis. And the second is that people are aware that transportation is the country, the United States, is largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, parking requirements kind of fall at the Venn diagram um, of those two issues. And so there's been a lot of attention to that. And cities are happy to get rid of them because more development, more housing units, um, less traffic. I mean, all those things sound really attractive, I think, to a lot of forward-thinking city planners. But none of that is going to produce the beneficial effects that people expect unless politicians can begin to make changes to the streets as well. And that's a place where I feel like Paris is really setting an example in making it safer, although perhaps not yet safe enough, um, for moms to take their kids to school on a bike. And that's a place where a lot of U.S. cities, even if they're um, talking a big talk about the need to stop driving so much, they've been reluctant to, to really redesign any streets at all. And, and frankly, compared to Paris, the amount of real estate that's locked up in American roads is just enormous, enormous potential that so far has gone mostly unrealized. Yeah, so, so just to get a little bit more granular and nerdy, putting together your last two answers, in a suburb in, say, Austin or L.A., there's a lot of road space. We can get rid of, let's say, half their parking spaces, and we use that to put in some bus lanes, bike lanes, and parks near the house so that kids can play. What, uh, we, we change zoning so that you can have more shops near houses. What are we, what are we doing? I think all those things are important. Um... I would add that one of the things that being less focused on parking um, allows you to achieve is increasing residential density. And that really is the, I think, the key thing for a lot of these suburbs. If we're going to retrofit those suburbs for the 21st century, and I think we should because we have a great urgency in the United States um, in creating more housing, and in particular in these relatively wealthy, high opportunity neighborhoods, um, if you begin to think a little differently about parking and you expect that new residents might not make every single trip in a car, um, then perhaps you open the door for more residential density. And I think um, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg question, but I think that as that kind of density begins to appear, as more and more people move into these suburbs, and these suburbs decide that it's in their interest to promote diversity in the housing stock so that you know, mom can age in place and the kids can find a place to live when they graduate from college. Young professionals like teachers and firefighters can live within town. Like all these things are necessary in moving away from the single family home system designed really exclusively for nuclear families. And nuclear families no longer make up the majority of households in America. So it's clear that the housing stock has to change. And I think with that change, um, in a company accompanied by some of the things you're talking about, 
um, all this is possible. So to get nerdy about it, that means like zoning reform and permitting multifamily properties in places that uh, previously had been reserved for single family homes. That was a an option we had in the 1950s. And today it seems like a luxury that we can't really sustain. I'm intrigued by the role of Paris in shaping your thinking. So as you're writing this book, I think you were already living some of the time here. And so you're seeing these two very different models of, of what a city is. And how, and then that changes again during COVID. How do you think that affected your thinking? I remember going to Hotel de Ville to chat with um, Christophe Najdowski, who the, was then the deputy mayor for transportation in Paris in, um, I think it was winter of 2020. And at the time, they had just rolled out the first bike lane on the Rue de Rivoli. The rest of it was still five lanes of traffic. Um, and that was considered at the time a kind of exciting innovation in two-wheeled transportation in the city. Um, and even then, it felt like Paris was doing exciting things um, to me as a New Yorker. Like I came here and I remember seeing, watching progressively the George Pompidou Expressway move from being turned into a park playground for a couple weeks every summer to finally being fully converted into a kind of promenade. And I don't think even the harshest critics of that decision, not even Rashida Dati would roll that back now. It seems like it's it's here to stay. And it was one of those things that when I saw it, I was like, well, this is, I mean, a lot of the lessons of Paris can seem hard to adapt to an American context because of course, we're never gonna have a metro system where the trains run every two and a half minutes and we're never gonna have an RER system like they have here. It's just not gonna happen. I've given up, sorry. But um, but that said, <laughs> I think there's some stuff here that I saw and I was like, this could work. And the, the Riverfront Expressway is one of them, right? Like you could easily imagine that on a big boulevard or a big avenue in an American city. And another one is is the school streets that they started doing during the pandemic where um, city is now closed. I think the count is up to two or 300 now um, streets outside schools to traffic. And if you haven't seen one, um, because maybe they don't have them in the seventh hour on these small, I'm not sure. But in the, the other certain other districts of the city, you can you can see they after school gets out, they become these kind of impromptu civic gathering places where parents and children and teachers are all crossing paths, along with a bunch of other people who have nothing to do with school life at all. You know, uh, women with their shopping carts and old men with suitcases. And it just seems like this city has such narrow sidewalks um, that when you open up a street, people really will take advantage of it. And that's something that could be adapted to any American city today, um, full stop. So, so that's another point where I got here and I felt, wow, this is, this is inspiring. I more and more get the sense going around the great cities that they look better than they ever have. You know, they're cleaner than they ever were. They're more accessible than they ever were. Is this too kind of rosy eye division? Yes. Yes, I think it is. Uh, have you been to uh, Port Authority bus terminal lately? New York City? Um, yes, good point. Uh, in general, in general, as we say. Um, I think there's, yeah, I think there's, there's two things happening. I mean, I think on a, on the level of, public space management, I do think there's a consensus emerging that the way things were in the 80s and 90s is not something we want to go back to, especially where traffic is concerned. And by the way, people have always been against traffic, right? It's just the parking they want. They don't want the traffic. Nobody wants, nobody votes for traffic. Nobody wants more traffic. It's just parking. And I think only in the last, honestly, 20 years has there been professional uh, a, a professional enlightenment about the fact that those two things are related. And if you build more parking, you will get more traffic. And if you take away the parking, you will get less traffic. And so um, I think that lesson has been taken to heart in a lot of places. And um, Paris is obviously one of them. In Paris, um, everywhere you see a giant underground garage that is, um, you know, one of those like big indigo garages, that was likely in the 1950s and 60s, a giant surface parking lot. So I'm talking about Invalide. I'm talking about the, the Parvis in front of Notre Dame. I'm talking about the Place Vendôme. 
like all of these iconic Parisian places were once parking lots. And, um, and so I think it's a long, slow process to, to move towards improvement, but I, I guess I share your optimism that things are getting better. My last question before I throw it open to the audience, what's been the response? What do people say? Do people say, oh, you're just some kind of, um, you know, big city elitist who doesn't care about ordinary people? Yes. Um, no, so far I've had a pretty friendly audience. I, uh, somebody was telling me that I got interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR a couple months ago. And somebody was saying that they had never seen anybody get a really get a rise out of Terry Gross until I got her onto the subject of center city parking in Philadelphia. Um, and so I think even for people who have, who share many of my political beliefs, like that we should have a cleaner environment, more affordable housing, more walkable neighborhoods, everybody's like, check, check, check. And then you get to the parking and they're like, oh, now hold on a minute. And so I think um, hopefully resolving that cognitive dissonance is is part of the project of this book is not saying to people you you are not allowed to drive your car anymore the 15 minute city police are going to keep you locked up now um but instead saying just realize just recognize that these are the trade-offs and these this is this is what's happening here and i think um most of my audiences people basically get that and at the end of the day some people still say well sorry but my parking space is more important and yeah, if that's your decision, then there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, thanks very much, Henry. Let's have some questions from the audience. Maybe if you could very briefly identify yourself and ask a brief question, no long speeches, please. Thank you. Can we have a, a round of applause first? Please wait for the microphone to be brought to you by Alice. Hi, my name is uh, William Jordan. I'm a uh, retired U.S. diplomat living here for quite a number of years. Um, one thing that I'm curious about uh, in terms of how you believe this is going to play out as the world is moving from uh, hydrocarbon-based fuels for cars to what now looks like primarily electric cars with a need, therefore, for all of these powering stations, these, uh, you know, uh, electrical uh, 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 places to, to chargers to, to, to plug into, how is that going to affect sort of the parking equation? Because I think, for example, here in Paris, where um, you still have a lot of people who own cars, park on the streets, and are you suddenly going to have this, this, this new war um, over whether those spaces are going to have to be maintained in order to provide the power generation? And since a lot of those power generators won't allow you to just park and, and leave your car plugged in until you're done, but you're supposed to move on to let somebody else power. How do you see that playing out going ahead? Very badly. <laughs> um, it's a massive, massive new challenge just at, at a moment when I felt like people were beginning to reassess the importance of, um, or the, the, the wisdom of consigning all this space to cars. And you're right. Now, every parking space is not just a place to store your car, but a place to fuel it up as well. And um, one option, obviously, is, OK, let's just say right off the bat, most people are going to do this at home in a private garage where they're going to install a charger that costs, I don't know, a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand dollars. Um, but for those of us, of course, who park on the streets of major cities, it's going to be a huge challenge. And that's also going to be a huge challenge for anybody who parks in a garage of a multifamily building, because adapting those to install chargers is also going to be expensive. And in some cases requires like redoing the whole building's connection to the electricity grid because of the amount of power that's going to be coming in. So, and then finally, all that infrastructure is just going to be expensive. I mean, even at the low end, if you're budgeting a couple thousand dollars for every charger, there's a billion parking spaces in the United States. So you do the math. It's a lot of money. It's way more than is in the Infrastructure Act. And, um, and especially for major city streets, whose responsibility is it? Private companies are not making money on those installations because people aren't willing to pay enough for the parking and they're not willing to pay a massive surcharge to fuel up in a sidewalk space when other people who own electric cars are getting it 
for you know half the price at home. So is the city going to subsidize companies to install these charging borns at every curbside spot? To me, that seems like it's going to be a gigantic handout to car owners in a system that already gives them so much free space. And frankly, it's just beyond the reach of most cities. New York City just did a pilot with Con Ed, and they're paying about $60,000 for every single curbside charging space. So that's not going to pencil out, and it's going to take a lot of um, charging to, to make that pay. I mean, I'm guessing that in Paris and other cities, it's going to encourage the move towards using taxis and ride-hail vehicles as the main source of car. Well, either that, or it just means that Paris and Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Chicago and all these other American cities just get left out of the EV shift. And we're all stuck driving dirty, polluting cars when everybody else has moved on to this newer, cleaner technology. Well, the EU has already said it's going to ban them, so that would be a big step back. So, right. Yeah. You won't actually have a choice here. That's true. Uh, another question. This man here. So, Alexis Gobar, I'm the aviation cousin of Henry, living in London for 22 years. My question to you, Henry, is um, parking great, but what about airports and what about um, um, rivers? So the future of cities and the future of work is about transportation. I agree, I spent 10 years at Airbus, but where do you see the future of basically, you know, um, the, the cities in like Paris, London, Lausanne, with the rivers and uh, with e-vitals, Joby Aviation, for example. So if you elevate the subject to the future of technology, parking would disappear. There would be something else flying around. So what's your view on that? Well, I guess um, when I was writing this book, I started writing this book at a moment of enormous hype for autonomous vehicles on the ground. Um, and Elon Musk said that an autonomous Tesla was going to drive from uh, across the United States the next year. This was in 2018. Never happened, obviously. Um, I think uh, there has since been like the sort of hype cycle has cooled somewhat since then. And um, and I, I don't know if we're ever going to see cities occupied by fully autonomous vehicles in my lifetime. Um, so I am hesitant to jump on board with I for, e ETOL. Is that what you said? Yeah, EV tall. So that's like um, airborne, like small airborne electric vehicles, like tiny little helicopters for each one of us. Um, I just feel like if we can't even like manage something as basic as like where to put the trottinette, like how are we going to do that? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it would be cool. I think it would be cool if it happened, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, hi there, uh, Alex Pischkanix. Uh, um, in in the uh, in the biz, uh, two questions. Take the one uh, you'd prefer. Uh, first, a question about um, the 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 book title, the famous book title. The predecessor is the high cost of free parking, right? Um, but there is actually a high cost of high cost parking as well, right? Uh, it's a bit of a syntax uh, in terms of uh, revenue for many cities. Um, uh, some cities, including the one that I came from, collateralized that asset uh, to fund their pension fund. Um, uh, how will cities ultimately, if they convert these spaces to higher and better uses, uh, make up the, the revenue gap? Um, and second question, perhaps answer, uh, talk about the relationship between parking and uh, the rise of e-commerce uh, and the change in the way that people can potentially use a trip interception, let's say, uh, getting something delivered to them rather than going out needing to find the parking space to do that trip. Um, great questions. I I, I want to first let's talk about parking as a revenue generator. One thing that I think is interesting about Paris is that so when Paris decided to take those hideous parking lots that were defacing the grand monumental places and squares of the city and turn them into gigantic underground garages, they found a concessionaire to do that for them. That company is now Indigo. Indigo is taking a bit of a hit as An Hidalgo implements these anti-car policies. They told me, their CEO told me that their occupancy is dropping about 2% every year. So it is interesting to ponder the alternate, alternate reality in which Paris owns those garages and Paris depends on them for revenue. Would Paris still be so gung-ho 
about um, banishing cars from the city center? I don't know. That's an interesting question. But to your point, um, many American cities make a lot of money from parking, um, both from uh, parking, first from parking violations, parking tickets, then from meters and garage taxes. Uh, I think that's a bad system. Um, I know that it may play an important role in the municipal budget, but parking should be managed uh, with an interest in creating the best possible city for everybody that creates this uh, the most access, really. That should be the primary goal, is ensuring that this crucial interface between the street and the buildings, between transportation and land use, is used in the most optimal and efficient way possible. And that is not the same as making as much money as possible. And what's funny about it is that in the high cost of free parking, Don Shoup, who is the godfather of parking studies, um, suggests that many of our problems could be solved by metering on street parking at a rate high enough to create empty parking spaces. But it turns out that in fact, raising the meter prices is not the way cities make the most money from parking because the way they make the most money from parking is by having lots and lots of illegal parking and by ticketing those people and trapping them in cycles of fines and debt. And so that's bad. And um, New York City makes twice as much money from parking fines as it does from parking fees. So that is a system that is designed to punish people basically. And um, I guess maybe it is how we're funding the pension fund, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> And also you indicated that there might be more lucrative ways to use that space. Of course, they have some money revenue coming in from that space, given how much that space is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like why? Right. I mean, if you were to think outside the box a little bit, you could imagine that that space that's currently generating a dollar an hour in meter payments might be generating $10 an hour in sales taxes. Uh, and then there was the second question. Oh, e-commerce. Um, boy, I don't know. I, I think um, one of the, one of the places where I, I wish I knew more is about corporate practices in terms of corporate parking lot design, because um, obviously there are all these laws that tell everybody what to do with their property and how much parking to build, but many corporations have independent standards about how much parking they want, and those are kind of not that easy to grasp, um, but I think they are changing as some of these businesses rethink what their primary model is, like Walmart is a good example. Walmart has been decreasing the size of their parking lots because they recognize that delivery is going to be a bigger and bigger part of their business going forward. And to me, the uncertainty about how much commerce in the future is going to happen via delivery, perhaps via airborne drone, as opposed to via somebody just driving to the store, as they did in the 20th century, is all the more reason not to build 10,000 parking spaces at the mall, because we just don't know how much those are going to be used in 10 years. And, um, and it, is, it is difficult to retrofit those spaces once they're built and to reform the type of urban development that, that grows around them. I'm very conscious that no women have spoken other than Alice briefly introducing us or asked a question. So please. We have, we have a woman here. I've identified, I found a woman. Thank God. Hi there, I'm a woman. Um, my name is Melissa. I'm a climate journalist. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what cultural changes we need to see happen alongside practical and policy changes. Um, so much of the attachment to cars in the United States um, is not only because people need them to move around, but also because it's related to ideas of liberty, of freedom. Um, and we see the same conversation happening with meat. We know it's bad for the environment, it's bad for human health and yet there's a huge cultural attachment. So I'm curious what solutions you would propose for trying to, to change the way that people view the car. That is a, that's a really great question and a really challenging topic. And I would welcome any, anybody who has any insight because I guess, Simon, to counter your, your optimism here, when you go to the United States and you see the increasing size of every vehicle, it just feels deeply, deeply antisocial, like people who have decided that they are just in it for their own personal safety and the well-being of everybody else on the road be damned. Like talking like every new truck has a hood that's like five feet off the ground. And you, you see photos of like children in front of these trucks and the blind spot in front of the truck is like 10 feet. I mean, it's massive. And it just feels like 
this is the trend that we're on. It makes me very pessimistic. So what to do about that? Um, I guess like that's part of what I'm trying to do in framing this issue, not as being about punishment. I'm not trying to scold people for driving. I understand that we are, um, we built a system in which most people have to drive most of the time to get what they want. Um, and I guess what I hope this book attempts is to reframe it as saying, uh, what, what, what this parking reformed future might offer you is in fact more freedom because you would have the freedom to not make the trip in a car. Uh, you would have the freedom to walk without worrying that you're about to be run over by somebody who's driving 60 miles an hour in a gigantic pickup truck. And I think there's a kind of freedom in that too. Um, it's a little less, it's maybe not quite as intuitive as the freedom to drive, which has been drilled into us over a hundred years. But I think a um, hundred years ago when the Model T was um, introduced, it would have been unthinkable to imagine that most people would be literally unable to walk to anything. But that is in fact the case in which we find ourselves in the United States today. What about the idea that for teenagers in the 60s, autonomy, freedom was the car and now it's the phone? That's very interesting. I, honestly, that I'm pro car then. <laughs> There's a lady here in the front. There's a microphone coming. I really don't need one, but anyway, uh, my name is Emil Martin. I'm a researcher in a totally different field. But um, following on from the last question, I've always, and I know this from personal experience, I don't, I don't think a lot. Of, I don't think everybody thinks of cars so much as transport. For an awful lot of people, they're a place. They're a private place that you you spend time in. I'm sure we all remember our parents listening to the end of the radio program. In other words, just not going in and facing whatever was going on in the house. And um, I think it's going to be very hard to disabuse people of that notion in the absence of free public spaces in city centres, where it's becoming harder and harder to find somewhere to basically sit down out of the weather without buying something. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. I think it's more than just good public transport. Yeah, that's that's a great point. One of the one of the great books um, about car culture in the 20th century is called From the Front Porch to the Back Seat. And it's a history of courtship. Um, and um, obviously that is uh, a pretty prominent uh, place that the car takes in at least the American public imagination. Is, is when we talk about the car as space for free, freedom for teenagers, right? Um, so uh, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, but I think that, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think that concept of the car as an independent space where you have time for yourself and an extension of your home and a place where you feel safe and protected and all that is necessarily incompatible with some of the changes that we could make. Um, in fact, I would even argue that some of these changes would make life better for people who actually depend on their cars. I mean, I think one of the criticisms that gets leveled at these, um, at, for example, people who would like to raise parking prices is that it's bad for working people. And I think there's an implicit um, assumption there that working people's time is not worth anything. When in fact, working people um, who work with their cars, I mean, uh, time may be more important to them than the dollar it would take to put in a parking meter. And so that's a, a way of saying that some of these changes, um, taking what are now discretionary car trips and encouraging people to make those trips in other ways, might in the end create roads that are more pleasant and more accessible and more useful for people who need their cars or really, really want their cars and want to make a trip that way. And also, if I may the space that people want of repose and calm, that could be the space that used to be a parking space. It could now be a mini park. It could now be a bench. We're going to have one last question from this man at the back, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. Real quick, yeah. In places like Japan and Hong Kong, where uh, space is very limited, you see the cars being stacked uh, on by elevators. Why hasn't this um, grown more in certain cities, in American cities or other places where space is limited? I've seen places in New York that have done it, but people maybe are just so anxious about getting their car stacked or they want it back really quickly. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know. Would you rather have your car on ground level at the bottom of the stack or up on the top of the stack? Anyway, um, I think that the short answer is that there is uh, only at a certain price point for parking will the use of a stacker get justified. And um, that price point only gets achieved in places like Hong Kong or Tokyo or New York City. And even in those places, somewhat reluctantly. I mean, the, the great paradox at the heart of parking is that people will do anything for it except pay for it and they and they really won't pay for it at all i mean people's reluctance to pay for parking is so ingrained that that type of safe uh space saving innovation can rarely be rolled out because rarely are the the rates high enough to justify that that kind of infrastructure um so that's really the heart of the problem right there is that everybody wants all this parking but nobody wants to pay for it